Welcome to Power by Ancestry. I'm your guide and host, Gracie Kunadu. On this episode, we have yet another question from one of our subscribers. So please keep your questions and comments coming, and if we can use them in an episode, we will do our best to do so. Here's the question. What are your thoughts on being initiated into more than one tradition? Let's step back for a moment. Let's say your mother's lineage, that her family line, has a strong presence for one African culture group, perhaps more than another, and the same for the father. I want to step back a moment because this is a bit of history here that I think will be helpful for processing this question. You see, in Africa's history, broad history, deep history, there have been lots of movement in that wide continent especially in the region of West Africa, in terms of activity in the last few thousand years, even you know, several millennia. And in that movement, it means people have been migrating. They mean they have been settling. It means they also have been what, procreating with overlapping or distinct cultural groups. And I want to give you a taste of how these groups essentially create themselves by establishing who they are by who they're not. So for instance, the people called Yoruba, they were called that by the Hausa people who called them Yoruba. Yoruba became Yoruba. The Igbo in Nigeria were called, what is now Nigeria, were called um, by the Aro people, Oya Igbo. The Akan people in Ghana, West Africa, they were called Tong or Tonoa by Tonoa by the Hausa people and Tong by the Mande people in, in the Savannah region, referring to a locust. And, you know, locusts are these insects that farmers hate because they eat the crops of the farmers. And so there's a way in which African peoples have their own, not stereotypes, but their own intra-African understandings, meaning how they see themselves and other distinct or overlapping African groupings, which is to say that all this movement and coalescing over thousands, if not millions of years means that there is no pure or purely singular group of people called Zulu or Yoruba or Akan or Hausa. That what we have here is intra-Africa, meaning within and among these African peoples, there have been exchanges, there have been coalescing, coming together, intermarriage, intercourse. You get the idea. And because there is no purely or pure one kind of African people, it means that African peoples under any banner, whether it's Akan or Yoruba or Hausa or Mende or Mandinka, they are composites. That is, they are a fusion of these ancestors representing perhaps primordial or early groups of people who came together through a range of mechanisms, including warfare, trade, migration, etc. That said, even if the mother lineage may be Zulu or Yoruba, in truth, they, they're more than that. What am I getting at? I'm getting at the fact that it doesn't really matter if it's purely one ancestral strain that's more prominent than the other in one sense. It doesn't matter in one sense because there is no purely one group of people at this point in time, perhaps in a very, very early and deep history. But it also matters, and this is where we go back to ancestry. It matters because there are ancestors who are more pronounced, who are more prominent in one's lineage, for whom speaks on behalf of the others. I'll give you an example. I have two strong contingents from West Africa. Akan, from what is now Ghana, West Africa, in terms of my ancestral group. The other is from what is now Benin, which is Yoruba Fon, or Eri Fon, Yoruba Fon, or Fonbe. These are my two strong camps, right? Sometimes I see them, sometimes I don't. But whom I speak to often is my grandfather, who acts as a representative for these thousands upon thousands of ancient, ancient ancestors that are millennia, if not more old. We refer to them as the bigger heads because they, they have seniority, right? And so my grandfather acts as a, what, intermediary, as a go-between. He'll say, wait, I'll get back to you. Let me speak to the bigger heads first. 
And so he would consult with these two camps, these two contingents that are, of course, the, these are my people. What we need to therefore establish is we need to have, first and foremost, a strong and effective ancestral connection to then therefore what? Mediate between the groups that have come to form who we are. Remember, we are a package of all of our ancestors, <laughs> all right? Some more pronounced than others. And the way to think about spiritual culture or spiritual practice is not looking for a pure or purely one side or one, but is to look for which are the pronounced and prominent groups that are there and to have an ancestor ancestors, meaning one or two, that act as what? Intermediaries to consult, to say, hey, our child, meaning me, because I'm a child in their eyes, our child needs some clarity on what to do or what to practice. And they'll say, well, this and this and that. You see that? So having a sense of connection allows you to essentially leapfrog much of the, the angst or the questions about which tradition to follow. This is not a matter of lottery balls popping up and deciding, okay, I'll just randomly choose one tradition and follow it. You could, but it comes with consequences that may not be what you have in mind. What I suggest, therefore, is do the ancestral work, the family history work, and from that, develop that connection with your ancestors and have a representative or two that will, what, go between the major and pronounced camps that make up the composite, that make up the package of your ancestry, and then put the question before them. And they will, you know, give you an answer to the representatives that will then come to you. At least that's how it works for me, and I'm sure it can work for you in similar, if not the same way. And by doing so, we don't arbitrarily adopt a tradition, as it were. We appropriately and within the stream of our ancestry, sit within the spiritual culture that is yours, that is your birthright. And so I have spiritual forces as, as, a, as a healer that I was born with from the Tano River in, in Ghana. That is the that's, that's a physical embodiment of that river. I have Tano uh, Musum, uh, or spiritual forces, but I also have a Yoruba Fong spiritual force popularly known as Shango. That's my people from Benin, from Ghana. <laughs> That's the two camps. Is there conflict? No. <laughs> because there are spiritual forces that ride with my, my peoples, that ride with my ancient peoples, and therefore my family, and therefore they ride with me. Oftentimes, we get bogged down by ideology, especially those African diasporic folks who live in the Americas and sometimes in Western Europe. We think in terms of purity and purely one thing. We're composites. And so there's no conflict between Shango and Takofi. They actually work together with me and for me. And therefore, if your mother happens to be Zulu, and there are probably healers in the family called Sengoma or Ngoma, use them. In Southern Africa, by the way, there's more of an emphasis on ancestors than there is spiritual forces. Where in West Africa, there's a more emphasis on, on spiritual forces. So keep that in mind as you work through your family history and therefore figure out which spiritual tradition or cultural, spiritual culture by which to embed yourself and, and, and practice. But let's say your mother is Zulu or the family line is, is prominently Zulu, then find out research, do the homework as to what it means to be a practitioner or a member, a cultural member of that cultural group and what are the traditions and spiritual culture of that group for then immerse yourself, including the language. And if the father is Yoruba, the same goes there. And so there's no conflict with having Zulu ancestral forces that ride with you and Yoruba spiritual forces that ride with you. In fact, that's compliment. And therefore the question of how to go about it is really a simple one of do the family history research, find out who you are vis-a-vis -vis the constellation of people that are your family and ancestry, and then put the question to them. Have a rep and put it to them to go ask the bigger heads, the ancient ones, the more ancient ones, 
and they will give you an answer. But the answer is right in front of us. There is no tension or conflict except for the ideology that we have, whether it's religious ideology or it's a political ideology. All ideologies are inhibitors of the kind of spirituality and spiritual culture that exists because they are intellectual formations, not spiritual formations. In other words, they operate on a dogma, whereas spirituality is dogma-free. And so the two can't really coexist. So put the ideology aside in terms of being whatever is one may claim for political reasons or religious reasons, and open up the, the, that, that, that spirituality that is dogmaless, and you will see how those parts that, of that package that make us who we are will be able to answer that question and more that you may have about spiritual culture and how to proceed and in what manner. I am Chris Kunadu. I've been your guide and host with this episode of Power by Ancestry. Please put your comments and questions or suggestions for other episodes in the comment section below. Until next time, stay well.